Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of our report, The Journey Ahead, What People Need from London Transport. Um, my name's Emma Gibson. I'm the director of London Travel Watch, and we're the official transport uh, watchdog for London and the wider rail area, representing all users of transport in London. Um, today, you'll be hearing from my colleagues, Trevor and Sophia, who will highlight the findings from our research. And after that, we'll have a short panel question session. So if you have any questions about the research, um, you can tweet us um, or email us at the um, addresses um, on the screen there, or you can put something in the YouTube chat um, up until about 2.45 um, when the uh, Q&A um, session will start. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, Sophia. Thanks, Emma. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. In early December, we ran a YouTube event to run through the initial findings of our future transport research, and we thought it would be useful to do something similar today to mark the launch of our report, which will be available to read after this event's finished. In case you didn't watch last time, or this is your first time hearing about what we've been doing, I'll just give a quick overview of the project and why we think it's important. As London's transport watchdog, we wanted to investigate some of the questions that people have been asking about what the future of London transport will look like. We knew that the pandemic was going to have a big impact on Londoners and we wanted to find out how people were feeling about travel and some of the issues that decision makers and policy makers should focus on in the coming years to make sure transport is greener, safer and better for people after the pandemic. So in the months leading up to Christmas, we set out to find out what people thought the future would look like. We spoke to transport users, representative groups, politicians to find out what they were hoping or expecting to see in the future. This report is a culmination of these conversations. Our aim was not to decide what's wrong and what's right, but rather to highlight the key issues that need to be focused on when we are deciding the way forward. Now more than ever, it is important to situate transport in the context of real life, society and the wider trends and pressures being placed on real people right now. Policymakers in all areas need to recognise how transport is key to conversations about housing, employment, equality and health. Across the board, the need to recognise and address inequality and injustice is being recognised. This came out strongly in nearly all the conversations we had. This report is a call to action to London's decision makers and policy makers. London has a lot to offer and with the possibility of a normal sum summer on the horizon, thanks to the vaccination programme, we feel it is even more important that these priorities are adopted. We'll begin now then with Trevor, who's going to talk us through the transport user survey and the scenarios for what the future might look like. Thanks, Sophia, and good afternoon. Uh, a key part of our research was that we wanted to hear views about London's transport from the people travelling in London. We ran an online survey for two months from the end of October last year, which asked people to tell us about any problems they have experienced when travelling in London and what they thought would help them most when travelling in the future. Many of the responses came from people in our digital community of transport users. This is a group of people who travel in London and who are happy to share their experiences and opinions on transport issues. It's open to anyone to join. We're really pleased that we had 1,255 responses. We're grateful to everyone who completed the survey. Two thirds of those who responded were aged 55 or over, and almost a quarter of replies came from those aged 16 to 44. We had slightly more male than female respondents, and the vast majority of respondents were white or white British. This was a self-selecting survey, and we acknowledge that the age and ethnicity spread of the respondents is not representative of London's demographic makeup. We did, however, try to speak to organisations representing the interests of Black, Asian and minority ethnic BAME Londoners and young people to help make the research more balanced. We are exploring ways we can make our digital community more diverse and representative in the future. We received replies from all London boroughs, as well as the City of London. Of those living in London, 40% of replies came from those in Inner London and 60% in Outer London. Although the vast majority of responses came from people who live in London, one in seven replies were from people who live outside London but who travel into the capital either occasionally or often. The first question we asked was, was, was about pro any problems experienced when traveling in London. As you can see from the word cloud, there are a wide variety of responses. Many of the problems mentioned are those that people in London have experienced for years. However, the impact of COVID-19 has added another dimension with new issues arising since the pandemic began and some existing issues being made worse. There are three key themes that came up in survey responses. The first theme is that of unreliable and overcrowded services. Delays and cancellations of services across the transport network were frequently mentioned. This is a persistent problem in London. There were also complaints about overcrowding on the bus, tube, train and overground, 
as well as overcrowding on platforms and more generally in stations. The impact of COVID-19 can be seen in mentions of school children using the regular scheduled buses rather than the additional school children only services. And also in the increased awareness of when there's crowding on the bus because fewer passengers are allowed to board in order to maintain social distancing. There were many com comments about infrastructure works being done on the street causing bus delays and congestion in general. This includes work which has taken place before and during the pandemic. We heard about traffic jams caused by cycle lanes, the impact of low traffic neighbourhoods, roadworks and traffic light phasing, and the temporary or long-term closure of some bridges across the Thames. The second theme covers the behaviour of other passengers. Many people were concerned about COVID-19 rules not being applied on the transport network. This included face coverings not being worn or being worn incorrectly, a lack of social distancing, and bus drivers not enforcing the maximum passenger number limits on their bus. More widely, there were concerns about other antisocial or illegal behaviour on the network. The final theme is about a transport network that can be difficult or impossible to use. A significant issue for many was poor accessibility on the tube and train, including a lack of step-free access at stations and the gaps between platforms and trains at stations. Some bus drivers were criticised for not pulling buses into the kerb, making it difficult and dangerous for some passengers to get on and off. There were comments about a lack of communication and limited information provided by transport operators. People highlighted a lack of live updates, including when or why services are delayed or cancelled, with no accurate information online. There were also comments about the absence of a London-wide bus map and a lack of next bus indicators at bus stops. Moving on to the second question, we asked what would help most when travelling around London in the future. We received a wide range of thoughts, some of which can be seen in the word cloud, Many responses offered potential solutions to the problems I've just spoken about. There are three key themes that came up in survey responses. The first theme was a need for more and better services on the bus, tube, train, overground and trams. There were also requests for more tube lines and stations, such as the proposed extension of the Bakerloo line into South East London, an expanded tram system and longer trains. People also want better local and orbital services and links and more express bus services. This may at least in part reflect the fact that during the pandemic, more people have been spending a great amount of time in the local area. It may also reflect that the majority of responses came from those who live in outer London. A future transport network will need to reflect both current and potential future demand for services, particularly outside central London. If it does not, the risk of a car led future will grow. The second theme was the need to travel with reassurance. People said they want visible and active staff across the transport network to give you information and provide reassurance about safety. They also want a greater police presence to deal with enforcement around antisocial and illegal behaviour. We heard that people wanted better enforcement of and compliance with COVID-19 rules. This includes the wearing of face coverings by those who are not exempt, maintaining social distancing and bus drivers enforcing the maximum passenger number limit on their bus. Our sister organisation Transport Focus has been regularly surveying passenger journey satisfaction during the pandemic. The most recent results have shown that the ability to keep a safe distance from other passengers is the most important factor in passengers' perceptions of safety across both bus and rail. A survey also brought a wide range of suggestions for a better infrastructure for cyclists, such as having more and segregated cycle lanes, better signage and joined up infrastructure between boroughs. The final theme was about the network becoming something that everyone can use. People talked about the need for better accessibility with more lifts and escalators at stations. They also wanted bus drivers lowering their buses at stops to allow passengers to get on and off safely and for there to be more toilets available at stations. There are a range of suggestions around providing better communication and information, such as bus maps, better live travel information, next bus indicators at bus stops, clear signage, access to Wi-Fi and online improvements, particularly to Transport for London's Journey Planner. Many comments about keeping the Freedom Pass and restoring full use of the 60 plus Oyster reflect TFL's current funding agreement with the government, in which holders of these concessions can only use them after 9am on weekdays. There is much enthusiasm for both concessionary tickets to be retained for work, leisure and socialising purposes, and also to help reduce car use. I'll now talk about the conversations we had and written submissions we received. We've not run a project quite like this before, but we felt it was important for us as an organisation representing transport users in London to start asking these questions. We reached out to a wide range of individuals and organisations, some of whom we've worked with before, but others who are new to us. And we're really grateful for how willing people have been to share their views. 
As part of this, we created four possible scenarios to describe what transport in London might look like in the future. We came up with these as a way to capture some of the ideas and visions for London's future transport network that other organisations, including TfL, were predicting or aspiring to. These scenarios are not black or white predictions, but we wanted to see which aspects of them were thought more likely or useful to the, pe the way people will travel in the future. The first scenario is based on TfL's initial prediction that travel in London has mostly returned to normal by the end of 2021. In this scenario, London transport has returned to around 80% of normal use. This means rail services, the tube and London's buses are running with about 80% of the normal number of people traveling before the pandemic. There are still busy peak times and less busy off peak times. This scenario largely reflects how things used to be with congestions on London's roads still a problem and many of the past problems remaining such as poor air quality and crowding on peak services. In our conversations, it was clear that many people will need to continue to travel for their work. As the House Builders Barclay Group told us, some people will have changing work locations. Barrett Mater from Trust for London, the organisation aiming to tackle poverty and inequality in London, also raised the issue that working from home is not possible for everyone. The people who are most likely to be affected by the pandemic are low paid people uh, working in the retail, catering, cleaning, uh, and care industries. Uh, and they have to travel into work. Some of us are fortunate to be able to work from home, uh, but those individuals, particularly those lower paid individuals, will need to travel in to carry out their duties and responsibilities. The second scenario is the same as scenario one, but instead of the normal busy morning and evening rush hours we're used to seeing, people now make journeys at times which are spread throughout the day and week. This is because workplaces and employers are more flexible about when their employees come into the office with many choosing to continue to work from home for at least part of each week. As London's largest bus operator, Go Ahead London, explained to us, demand will likely be spread in a way that it currently is not. The third scenario is that London becomes a 15 minute city. In this scenario, central London becomes much less of a focus. People are staying more in their local areas, boroughs or nearby towns to do daily activities like work and shopping, or going to school, college or university, or to see friends and family. There is still travel into central London, but for most people, this is usually when they are making trips for leisure activities, to meet up with people who don't live near them or for the occasional business trip. There is much more active travel too, namely public transport, walking and cycling. Sustrans, the charity making it easier for people to walk and cycle, told us that many people are currently trapped in car dependency. The final scenario is that London becomes more a more polycentric city. When we say polycentric, we mean that instead of having one big centre of the city, central London, as the most important area for work and travel, we now have many urban centres across inner and outer London playing a bigger role in the economy. There is also now more travel around London and in outer London areas, with people moving between different parts of the city without going first into central London. As the Child, Pro Child Poverty Action Group has noted here, having better transport services in outer London will help many people, such as those with caring responsibilities. In terms of the individual scenarios, more than half of people thought scenarios two and three were more likely to happen. When scenario one was chosen, it was often paired with scenario two, usually because whilst future travel patterns will remain the same for some people, it will be different for many others. When scenario three was chosen, it was often paired with scenario four, because people thought an arising active travel would happen in local areas, and outer London centres may become more of a focus for jobs and shopping. Overall, we found that most people and organisations are expecting things to largely return to some sort of normal, but changes to lifestyles and travel habits vary for different people and in different parts of London. Many people have benefited from the ability to work from home, but some industries and jobs have seen very little change as they cannot work from home. Lots of people agree that many in London have been travelling around their local area more, which is likely to continue in the future. This makes it even more important that active travel is accessible to all people. Thanks, Trevor. So moving now on to the next section of the presentation, we're just going to talk through the six priority areas we identified in our research. For each priority, we've identified three key themes we think people need to focus on in the future. So for priority one, we chose to look at the street. Travel in London is not just about the part of the journey which is on the bus, tube or train. It is a door to door experience which starts when you leave your home and ends when you arrive back home. Whether waiting for a bus, walking to the shops or hailing a cab, the street has to be shared with different people and different types of transport. 
There has been a lot of rapid change on London streets in the last year as a result of TfL's street space programme, a series of changes like low traffic neighbourhoods and pop-up cycle lanes that have been designed to encourage more people to take up active travel, basically giving more priority space on the street for walking, cycling and public transport. We know that if we want to get to a more sustainable future, London has to move away from high car use and give more space to people using active travel modes. What came out in our research is that how this is done is incredibly important to make sure that streets are accessible and inclusive. So the first thing London streets need is a better approach to accessibility. Many of the access issues that came up in our conversations we have known about for a long time, but some were new and associated with the fast pace at which some of the street space changes were introduced. Whether it is a lack of drop curbs and pavements, pavement clutter like stray A-boards or e-scooters, inaccessible streets add to the general lack of accessibility on other parts of the transport network and in other public spaces. Transport for All, a pan-impairment organisation representing disabled and older transport users, recently published their research looking at the issues faced by disabled people on London streets. Their research found that 45% of people discussed barriers disabled people face to active travel and cycling, 53% of people raised issues with public transport, and 42% of people raised issues with street space. We spoke to Kirsty Hoyle, CEO of Transport for All, who told us about these issues and what could help make sure accessibility is prioritised in streets design and active travel schemes. We need to be more honest about the accessibility of our changing streets and where they aren't accessible and not hide from that but be open about what we're going to do about it and invest in it. So like Transport for All, we think the solution lies in prioritising meaningful collaborative consultation with residents and transport users. Our recommendation is that transport authorities should engage with disabled people to find co-produced solutions to streets designs together. You can look up TFA's report and recommendations on their website. So another key priority that came out of our discussions was the need to make sure that policies to encourage more active travel are inclusive and equitable. This means that everyone is considered in policy making decisions and policies seek to address the different barriers that different groups will face so that everyone can participate and benefit. When we look at cycling, for example, we know it is a healthy and flexible transport option and could be suitable for a wide range of journeys. But how do we make sure everyone has a chance to try it out? We know that some groups of people are less likely to take up cycling. The barriers facing these groups vary greatly depending on where you live, your income and your access to safe infrastructure. Policy solutions need to go further than improving the physical infrastructure of the street. As SUSTRANS have noted here, policy makers need to find out what would help people most and provide support in a wide range of ways to make sure everyone has a chance to try it out. When we spoke to young people, for example, some told us they were put off trying cycling because they were worried about having their bikes stolen and having nowhere to store them. Without safe storage, cycling was therefore not an option. Overall, what was clear from our discussions is that active travel needs to be prioritised when designing and planning the physical infrastructure of London. The most common mode of transport used in London is walking, and it is a key part of the active travel agenda. Yet pedestrians often face the worst barriers on the street. Vision Zero, which aims to cut the number of deaths and serious injuries on London streets, is key to tackling this, but improvements also need to be made to pedestrian spaces. Too often, pavements are uneven, poorly maintained or have difficult crossings that prioritise cars and not people. This was something that came up when we spoke to Jemima Hartshorn, founder of Mums for Lungs. We think pedestrians, cyclists and bus users should be equally considered and given the space they need to travel safely when designing streets. So I'm going to move on now to our second priority, uh, feeling safe when travelling in London. For transport users, safe means a variety of things. There is feeling safe in the physical sense, such as safe from crime and safety in your own personal security. It is also about operational uh, safety, being able to move safely across roads, station platforms or when boarding buses. There is also feeling safe in terms of your health. In the short term, this might mean trying to avoid getting COVID-19 until the vaccine offers widespread protection and seeing good levels of mask wearing compliance and physical distancing. In the long term, it is cleaning up the air we breathe and reducing emissions which have a life-threatening impact on Londoners. The first major theme that came up was the issue of air quality and pollution. In recent years, there has been significant progress in tackling the air quality crisis in London, but more than 100,000 Londoners still live in areas that exceed the legal limits for pollution. 
We also know that that health risk falls unfairly on those who are not responsible for the high levels of pollution, including children, public transport users, and those in areas of high deprivation. This injustice came up in many of the conversations we had. The pandemic has given many Londoners the experience of a different way of life, a different pace of life and different priorities, where health impacts and cleaner air are really important. With the Carlet recovery, it's all the negative impacts that this brings to uh, communities as a whole and to individuals, especially those with health needs. Uh, it is well documented that issues like uh, air pollution and road danger affect disproportionately the poorest members of our society and they are the people who cannot afford cars. So uh, really the effects fall disproportionately on people that don't contribute to the problem. It is essential that policymakers address these huge inequities so everyone has an equal opportunity to live and travel in safe conditions. Another key theme we found was around personal space and the sense of personal security, which is incredibly important to most transport users, but particularly heightened for some. Many of those we spoke to raised concerns about traveling on public transport at busy times. This is something that was a problem pre-pandemic. No one likes to travel on overcrowded services and never get a seat. But this fear of being close to other passengers has been worsened by the threat of COVID-19, with people more aware than ever of their personal space when traveling. For transport users, reassurances about safety and hygiene measures, how busy train and tube services are, and the ability to socially distance has never been more important. In the future, we think this idea of reassurance and giving transport users as much information as possible about their journeys and what their services will be like is really important. It became clear early in the pandemic, there was a disproportionate risk of getting seriously ill for certain groups of people if exposed to the virus. This has meant some passengers have felt a heightened sense of anxiety when traveling. This greater risk included people from some BAME groups, those with underlying health conditions, as well as older and disabled people. While the vaccination program continues to roll out, we are all hopeful that the risks of transmission when traveling will be reduced. However, we think the past year should be a wake up call for transport policymakers to do more to understand the views and needs of underrepresented transport users. Some of these groups who have been less safe when traveling during the pandemic also face other barriers to the transport network. We know that many of the inequalities that predated the pandemic have also worsened. All of us working in transport need to make sure that more is done to gather insight from lesser heard voices when making decisions about transport and what people need. This way we can make sure all passengers feel safe when traveling and address the concerns or barriers facing particular groups. Thanks, Sophia. The third key priority that came up in our research is the bus. The bus is a key service for London and came up in a lot of our conversations about the future. The bus is the most accessible and affordable choice and more people travel on the bus than the rail or the tube. Before the pandemic, there were over 6 million bus journeys in London every day. Despite this, we've heard from bus users less than users of other public transport. The bus is used most by lower income Londoners, including many key workers who have been keeping the capital running during the pandemic. It is essential that the financial risk posed to TfL due to COVID-19 does not reduce the investment in London's buses. Crucially, buses are also key to meeting future sustainable transport targets. Time and time again, bus passengers put journey time and reliability as their top priorities, and our research again confirms this. But in recent years, bus journey times have hit historic lows, and the average bus speed has been stuck at 9.3 miles per hour for the last three years. So at a time when more people need to be enticed away from their cars and onto public transport, poor bus performance puts people off. We think that buses need to be prioritised on London streets. This will enable faster journey times and make buses a more reliable option. The debate around the allocation of road space between different types of transport has increased with the rollout of the street space scheme. But it is essential that bus priority, such as 24-7 bus lanes, is brought in alongside improvements to the street, which encourages safe walking and, gut and cycling. As the graphic shows, a fully loaded double-decker bus can take up to 75 cars off the road. The great advantage of the bus is that fares are kept relatively low, especially compared to most other transport options. This is essential as bus users tend to be on lower incomes compared to those who, for instance, use the train. Our conversations also highlighted how the hopper fare has been a great help to many passengers, particularly those on lower incomes. In addition, the importance of protecting concessionary schemes, such as the zip card, 
60 plus Oyster Card and Freedom Pass are critical for younger and older Londoners. They provide vital access to jobs, education and social interaction for many Londoners. Last year, we campaigned to keep the zip card as a lifeline for young people, particularly those living in poverty. Use of concessionary tickets also helps to keep car ownership levels low. Affordability of the bus is even more important in the current economic crisis. Poverty and inequality have worsened during the pandemic, with older and younger Londoners more likely to be out of work long term and families struggling due to loss of income. This is something which London Assembly member Caroline Russell mentioned when we spoke to her. The pandemic has exposed and worsened the impact of poverty and precarious employment, especially for disabled, older and younger people in low income households. We need to be very aware of this, especially as affordable transport options are limited by the continuing need to stay apart and at risk of reduction due to TfL's funding squeeze. We think that keeping bus fares as low as possible is key to ensuring that the bus is available for everyone to use and to provide an attractive alternative to using a private car. We know that the bus is used more often by the older and younger rather than the middle-aged, by those with a lower income rather than higher income, by disabled people more often than non-disabled, and by ethnic minorities, particularly black people. We know too that many journeys made by bus are not just to get to work, but for caring responsibilities, health purposes and shopping, and often involve lots of stop-offs along the way, particularly for women and those with children. We spoke to Amy LeMay, London Nightsar, who told us why the hop affair is especially helpful for women. We also know that women in London are more likely to use the bus than men, with almost two thirds taking the bus at least once a week. Bus passengers have historically had a lower profile and been less well represented in transport policy conversations. Many have no choice apart from the bus, but we don't know enough about what would help them the most. We think that more needs to be done to represent these key user groups to make sure that the transport network works for everyone. The fourth priority that we've highlighted is outer London. There are different transport challenges facing inner and outer London, so there will need to be different strategies to deal with this. Outer London is particularly defined by poorer public transport connections, higher car ownership, and a lack of transport options to other parts of outer London. So the challenge of shifting away from private car use will be even greater in outer London. To highlight the challenges facing outer London and some potential answers to them, we'll use the example of the borough of Harrow in Northwest London, which came up in a number of our conversations. First of all, what became clear is that in outer London, restoring confidence in the bus will have to be a key part of efforts to encourage a shift away from car use. Research by Transport Focus revealed that once COVID-19 no longer poses a significant risk, 40% of people in London said that they will drive more than they did before, compared to 33% nationally. This could have a potentially significant impact in outer London, where more than two thirds of households own a car, compared to only 40% in inner London. When traveling from one part of outer London to another, it is often easier to travel into central London and then out again. We think that better services across boroughs and orbital routes that go around London have the potential to open up more sustainable travel possibilities in outer London. Better orbital bus services can connect transport interchanges in neighboring boroughs, also making it easier to get around for work, healthcare and shopping. London Assembly member and chair of the Transport Committee, Alison Moore, told us about the benefits of enhancing cross borough links in outer London. Much of London's transport links are radial, running into and out of central London, driven by commuter journeys, central London's cultural, cultural offering, and of course, central London universities. However, there would be significant benefits to enhancing orbital cross borough links in outer London to support access for learners, particularly in the skills based and further education sectors that will be vital as London's economy rebuilds post pandemic. It's also important for those on, in lower income, physical and peripatetic jobs, for example, in the care market, where people are likely to be living, travelling and working in neighbouring boroughs. If we want to avoid a car led recovery in outer London, a well connected, accessible and affordable travel uh, will be vital and also has the potential to support local small and medium sized business growth during the recovery. More express bus routes could also be provided in London, which have fewer stops and faster journey times. In Harrow, for example, an express route links the borough with other key locations and Heathrow Airport. We welcome that there is full step free access at London Overground, TfL Rail and DLR stations, as well as at tram stops. We think that continuing to make accessibility improvements on the transport network will be crucial to remove barriers for many people who cannot currently use public transport. 
In our survey responses and conversations, we picked up a, a problem with a number of tube stations in the Harrow area, which had either partial or no step-free access, including the case of Stanmore Station. Bob Blackman, the MP for Harrow East, spoke to us about this. In my constituency, we have the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital, which is one of the centres uh, for dealing with people with spinal uh, injuries and uh, extra surgery and recovery. Now, at the moment, we can't encourage people to come to the hospital by public transport because Stanmore Station, uh, which we've campaigned for for an extended period of time, does not have a lift and doesn't have step-free access. So basically, clients coming to the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital have to drive to it. So if we're going to be joined up about the approach on public transport and we want people to use public transport, we have to enable them to do so. Therefore, getting a lift at Stanmore Station has been a vital part of my campaign and will continue to be so until we achieve it. This problem is not unique to Harrow and examples can be found across London. This therefore limits accessibility for young and old alike, excluding a large number of potential passengers from the public transport network. It's also important to note that step three does not always mean fully accessible on the tube network. Encouragingly, we know that many people have been walking more in the lockdowns. However, it is concerning that in outer London, 40% of journeys are being made by car. It's also been calculated that about 80% of these car journeys are short enough to feasibly be switched to active, efficient and sustainable modes now. So a key challenge in outer London is to encourage more active travel by creating safe and convenient routes between town centres, places of education and residential neighbourhoods. As Safia explained earlier, we think this needs to be done in a way that is inclusive and with local communities. The organisation Fair City, who promote accessible, equitable and sustainable city transport, recently surveyed sixth form students at a West London school. They found that nearly 70% of the students said that ease and convenience was key when choosing their mode of travel, rating higher than speed, cost and safety. There's also a role for what's called personalised transport, a bike, electric bike or scooter. London Assembly member Keith Prince spoke to us about this. Public transport in Havering and Redbridge is not that bad actually. And if you want to get from east to west, i.e. go from say Romford into central London, very easy. The big problem for Havering is travelling north to south. If you want to go from the top of the borough down to the bottom, that really is a problem. And that's where personalised transport is going to play a major role if we're going to get people to be more active. We think that if personalised transport is planned for carefully, it will allow for individual flexibility without adding to car traffic on the roads. So moving on then to priority five, reflect changing lifestyles. After the pandemic, many of the temporary changes in society may become permanent. And so planning a transport network to assist this change will be really important. We found that what people need is flexibility and better options that allow people to continue the changes to their travel habits that benefit them the most. We also need to remember that despite the huge changes for some, many people cannot work from home and core services will need to still support journeys at peak times. Careful consideration of the different needs of London transport users will be needed. Although working from home has been a significant trend in the last year, there is a big question as to how much of this will continue. A common view was that people will still commute but do so less frequently and when they do, they may decide to do so outside of peak hours. Season ticket sales have been in decline for some time now and with the rise of working from home trends and more flexible working, it makes sense that more flexible ticketing options are available. Flexible season tickets will be really important to get commuters back on the railway as many people are unlikely to go back to the office full time. They would also benefit part-time workers, many of whom have been commuting part-time for years and are long overdue tickets that match their travel needs. Tickets and services will need to be attractive enough to ensure that public rather than private transport remains the default option for those who travel. There is already recognition within the rail industry that change is needed. Earlier this week, we had both good news and bad news on the rail passenger front. Whilst fares have now gone up by 2.6%, it was also reported that flexible season tickets are on the way later this summer. We spoke to Spencer Palmer from London Councils, who talked about some of the issues around changing lifestyles. Hello, I'm Spencer Palmer, Director of Transport and Mobility at London Councils. When thinking about the future of travel beyond COVID-19, 
people will want to return to normal. And I believe there will still be a general and gradual shift towards what people consider to be normal. But also, I believe we will retain some of the positives that we've gained through the new ways of living and working we've perfected, particularly in terms of remote working and virtual meetings, for example. This will reduce the need for travel and save time for us all. So if Monday to Friday daily commuting becomes a thing of the past for some passengers, the option of living further from the workplace might become more attractive for some. This change in working patterns could encourage people to move to areas where property prices are more affordable. For those who commute into central London, this may mean moving further into the suburbs or even moving outside London entirely. The positives of this could be more work opportunities for people living outside London, bringing in workers from towns and cities further away from the capital. One of the issues to think about for, for the longer term is that uh, people uh, may well come into work uh, more less frequently uh, as they shift that balance between home working uh, and working in the office. And if you come in less frequently, one of the issues that might happen is that people may, may choose to come in further by the commuter belt for, city, uh, for the City of London might become a bit bigger. Uh, and I think that's one of the issues that we need to consider in the kind of future scenario planning for uh, for managing the city and managing our relationship with the wider southeast. One of the issues with a bigger community belt, though, is affordability, though, because if you're coming in for uh, longer distances, uh, potentially because you can afford a kind of bigger house or flat uh, further afield, your travel expenses may well increase as a result of that. So all of these issues we need to be mindful of in assessing the uh, future travel scenarios for the city. We are still yet to see how the housing market will be affected by the pandemic long term, but unaffordability in housing and transport has long been an issue for many Londoners. Not all Londoners will have these choices available to them, and so we need to recognise that some people are already li living further away from work and doing jobs that can't be done from home, simply because there is no affordable option for housing closer to work. Future transport services need to recognise that choice isn't always available for all transport users. In industries such as construction, retail and catering, along with much of the nighttime economy, the option for working from home just simply doesn't exist. So while some travel patterns may change, core services that help early morning and evening peak workers to get around the city must be protected. London's transport network will need to reflect broader changes in society, such as the rise of online shopping and working from home, but also social changes such as the growing number of unpaid carers and an ageing population. The way people travel differs according to occupation and journey purpose and may require different responses. There are many who travel for unpaid work such as caring or volunteering, as well as people with different shift patterns and who travel during the night. In this case, services such as the night tube are invaluable. We need to remember that whilst much of the focus has been on the home working revolution, the majority of journeys are not to paid work. Travelling for the purpose of social events, entertainment, shopping and leisure will all return at some point soon and the transport network needs to be ready for this as well. So moving on now to our final priority, we're calling for London's decision makers to really embrace new solutions to meet the transport challenges of the city. London has always been eager to experiment with innovative solutions and technology, whether that's the congestion charge or the introduction of the Oyster card. Our conversations highlighted the scope for London's transport network to embrace big ideas, to meet de demand and sustainability goals. This priority is about pulling together the other areas we've covered to make sure the challenges facing London are met with bold and innovative policy making. So if we take one of the most pressing challenges facing London, competing demand for road space, as an example, the idea of a user-based road charging scheme came up quite a few times. Many of those who mentioned a new charging scheme recognise that it will take political will for it to take off. But coupled with an investment in public transport options, a new charging scheme could replace existing charges like ULES and help make sure people using London's roads fairly contribute towards the environmental cost of their journey and provide an effective way to reduce congestion. We also found other um, solutions to congestion that had been tried but not implemented on a wider scale. For example, a number of conversations looked at the potential for car clubs to combat high car ownership, particularly in outer London. Car clubs allow people to borrow and pay for the use of a car as and when they need it. They lower the ongoing costs of owning a car and reduce the number of vehicles on the road. 
by using car clubs rather than owning a car, people may be more likely to think twice about using a car for shorter journeys, which could easily be done by bus cycling or walking. Whatever London's decision makers decide to do, the scale of some of these challenges will require bold and innovative solutions, many of which exist but need backing to get off the ground. Jemima from Mums for Lungs spoke about the need for more proactive, innovative policies to help make sure London is safer for everyone. To protect lives and health, we need a strong overhaul of the transport system, smart ride price, user charging, higher parking charges and more costly resident permits, as well as cleaner buses, cheaper and more reliable public transport, safe segregated cycleways and bike storage. All of these things are part of the solutions needed to make sure that the air is clean and everyone can be healthy and happy in London. So embracing new technology will also be part of meeting these new challenges. On a smaller scale, micromobility with its offer of more flexible options for journeys by scooter, bike or electric bike are increasing in popularity. A 12 month trial of rental e-scooters in the capital led by TfL and London councils will begin this spring. This will help policymakers work out how they can be safely and fairly integrated into the active travel offering in London. Electric vehicles offer a further option to reduce harmful emissions from private vehicles. With nearly 6,000 charging points now installed around the city, they will be a key part of improving air quality in London in the future. Embracing electric vehicles is something that TfL are committed to, an example being the increasing number of electric buses providing TfL services in London. Our last priority centres on the need for better information on apps, web pages and journey planners. Better live and reliable information when planning journeys will be crucial to keeping the confidence of those using the transport network and to encourage people to switch to more sustainable ways to travel. Apps can also provide key information about accessibility, letting passengers know when lifts and escalators are out of order. We know that the transport industry is currently working on better integrating information across services, providers and digital platforms, so hopefully we'll see good progress on this soon. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, looking ahead to the medium and long term future, we basically want policy makers and decision makers to prioritise the issues we've described in the years ahead, making sure transport is seen in the context of wider societal issues around inequality, affordability and accessibility. In the short term, we're looking towards the London mayoral and assembly election in May and have come up with four mayoral asks for transport that we'd like the candidates to put in their manifest. We'll be promoting these asks in the coming weeks and later this summer we'll be launching a bus campaign which will pick up on many of the issues that we've raised in this research. We also want this report to be an invitation to anyone wishing to have a further conversation about the needs of London's transport users and we'd welcome opportunities to work together to support making positive changes and better representing people travelling in the city. Um, so I think now we're going to be responding to some questions before finishing the event, so thanks. Thank you, uh, Safia and Trevor. Um, for that presentation. I'm now going to put a selection of questions uh, to, to the panel, uh, Safia, Trevor and Emma, about the report and the themes that came up. So we've had quite a few through the uh, chat function and uh, via Twitter and uh, by email. So here we go. Uh, firstly, there are quite a few questions about um, the need for orbital and express bus routes and how it would make people's lives a lot easier. So um, I don't know if uh, Trevor would perhaps like to have a go at that one. Yeah, sure. Yes, we absolutely agree about the, the importance of having those, those routes. Uh, it did come up a lot of times in our interviews and the survey so survey responses we got. Um, I mean, in all parts of London, but particularly in outer London, if we're going to reduce car use, um, then the bus needs to be better. So you know, that's why we really want to focus on the bus being convenient, accessible and reliable. Um, so that's part of the reason for wanting to prioritise the bus on the roads. Uh, to make it easier for everyone to be able to access the bus for whatever purpose that is, you know, we talked about work or healthcare or shopping or leisure facilities, and also to have good kind of cross borough buses and then good key interchange locations for them so that people can easily make access between other bus services uh, and other transport options. And yes, also on the, the express buses, is something we, we are keen for at TfL to further explore. There are some limited express bus services at the moment, um, key locations such as Westfield, London and Croydon and Heathrow Airport, but definitely if, if it can be sustainable to run those routes that could be a way to encourage people on to, to public transport that may not be getting a car but if you're seeing a shorter journey on a bus than they would have otherwise had then the yeah, express bus could be a, a really good idea to, to put into place. Thank you very much Trevor. Um, we'll move on to the next one uh, which deals with sort of younger people's issues. 
Um, so this one comes from Pete uh, from London via email. Um, what did young people tell you about what they want from future transport? Uh, Safia, would you like to have a go at this one? Yeah, sure. Um, so we, we know a fair bit about what young people want um, from this research, but also from the, the Save the Zip Card campaign from last year. So particularly for sort of younger people age 16, 17 and 18, we really found that the Zip Card's really important to them. Um, it provides a lifeline to a lot of young Londoners and really helps give them that independence and in getting around and they really value that. Um, but I think also, you know, we, we found in this research that, that young people share a lot of the concerns of other age groups, particularly around safety and personal security on transport. So I think that's another kind of issue that we picked up. Um, to be honest, on around students and kind of older young people, so people in their 20s, we don't know as much. Um, but I think kind of in the coming year, we're probably going to be looking at that a bit more because young people are facing a lot of hardships at the moment. The kind of unemployment um, levels are quite high and housing um, and affordability issues. So I think finding out a bit more about what young people need and what they want from transport is going to be really important. Thanks, Safia. Uh, right, the next one, quite a broad question. So I'm going to give you each a go at, uh, at answering this one. Um, it's, it's really long lines of, you know, um, we had it by email, long lines of, um, you have a lot of uh, priorities, but um, what do you think is the most important out of them? What, what, you, what should you prioritise out of your priorities? Mm. Do you want to start, Emma? Um, yeah, it is hard, isn't it? But I think if I had to prioritise, say, two, if that's allowed, I think for me it would be um, having a new bus strategy for London. Um, so making just bus journeys faster and more reliable and looking at new routes which actually take people where they want to go, um, especially in outer London. Um, and then I think my other priority would be generally around removing the barriers um, to that stop people from getting around London. Um, so that might be um, designing streets in a more inclusive way and giving everybody kind of better access to the streets so that it's safer and easier to get around when you're on foot. Um, but also that would include for me, um, retaining the option to use um, cash um, to pay on the, the train and underground and, and keeping fares affordable. Thanks Emma. Um, Trevor, what's your take on this one? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd just add, add to that as well, um, because we've seen a, a change, some people working from home, but other people haven't been able to work from home. So it's still going to be really important to keep the service levels up at the core times. So the people who have to use the, the transport at the peak times shouldn't be forgotten. Um, obviously, things like the nighttime economy, hopefully later in the summer, that will become roaring back. Um, so keeping all these different aspects that, that, uh, that are possibly going to change, some things will remain the same, some things will change, so that the, the flexible transport network will be able to adapt um, whether it is by bus or other other modes across London, just keeping that kind of focus uh, as we go ahead. Thank you, Trevor. Um, Safi, have you anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, no, I think I'd just echo what Emma said. I think accessibility and, and, and making sure the transport network's inclusive. Um, I mean, there's just been so many issues around affordability and, and access, but I think that the pandemic's really hammered that home that we need to make sure that is a priority because it it helps everyone, you know, making the transport network more accessible. Um, but everyone also has a right to public transport and everyone should be able to, to use it and it should be affordable as well. Thanks to the panel for those, uh, those answers. Um, moving on, uh, we had a question by email from Roger French. Uh, he says, uh, what does the panel think the chances are of persuading TfL to do a U-turn on what he calls their ridiculous uh, policy of not making network bus maps uh, available both online and in print? Who would like to have a go at that one? Trevor, perhaps? Um, I, I know it's something we are keen that, that um, there is a kind, of, a, a kind of paper map, something we push TfL on. Um, there is a bus map, an independently produced one, which I have a link to from our website uh, on, on that. So, yes, it's something that's different and outrageous, something we, we do pursue with TfL on to kind of get that. Uh, to make, because we recognise that the lot of technology, but not everyone has had the um, ability to have that technology for apps and things like that. So yes, that, that is also important for us. So yeah, we'll definitely keep on, on with that. Yeah, I mean, I'll add that um, we had the TfL commissioner, Andy Byford, came to our, our board meeting a few months ago and we asked him about this and he did say he would go away and look into it. Um, so, you know, the more people that we've got telling us that it's important to them, the more the more times we can ask them um, about it. 
Thanks, Trevor and Emma. Um, moving on, we've had a little bit of uh, comments in the chat uh, and we've had emails as well about it. Um, this issue I'm going to talk about now, uh, which is um, concessionary passes. Now, I'm going to read out a, a comment, sort of comment stroke question from Johnston Walker. Uh, who said, um, in my area, I never see buses uh, without, with um, more than 10 to 15 people on them. Um, so passes um, that were usable before 9 a.m. Um, before, um, some of us could actually use them, um, especially when it's freezing cold in the winter. Um, Safir, did you want to have a go at answering, um, you know, what, what do you think about concessionary passes? Yeah, no, I, th I think we we support concessionary passes. We, we definitely called for them to... Um sort of be protected um even though tfl had a sort of difficult financial situation on their hands um which is kind of the focus of our campaigning last year but we definitely support bringing back the full kind of time allowances of the concessionary passes in the future because we can sort of recognize how that helps people making a variety of journeys thanks very much safir well those are those are all the the key sort of questions we've we've received um lots of of um comments and people chat good to see people chatting and um uh you know talking to each other on on the um, on the chat on youtube um so uh, if anything is, is posted on there um towards the end of this and um, then we'll obviously get back try and get back to people and um comment in the um underneath the, the video when it's um posted uh, on demand but um i'd now like to hand back to emma for some final words Emma, you're on mute. <laughs> Thanks very much. What an amateur mistake. Um, so really, it just falls for me to say thank you. Um, on any of the initiatives that we've suggested. Um, so, um, and our report is now available on our website. So as soon as you leave this webinar, um, you'll be able to go and um, have a look at it and read the full research findings. So thank you very much, everybody. And I'll see you at the next one.